These have been two wonderful papers, and I will try to be shorter um, in following on. This is a session that focuses on what comes from teaching literature in the classroom. Each of us will be talking about the ways in which that means collaborative constructions of meaning making in classroom situations in interaction with teaching. Brian began uh, by talking about the way in which other cultures enter the Canadian classroom through the participants in the classroom, the students, and through the text that he chose for the curriculum. Alberto talked a little bit about how Canadian literature enters his Brazilian classroom and then how African literature enters his Brazilian classroom. And I'm going to start by talking briefly about the way in which stylistic decisions about how to tell a story influence its interpretation in uh, a Canadian classroom. And I want to pick up on um, one point that Alberto stressed, the focus on what the text does to the reader and the way in which the reader responds to that affective influence. So I'm going to talk briefly about a novel I taught in Canadian classrooms by a writer named Andre Alexis. This is a book called Childhood. And it begins in the first person voice with a nameless narrator. And this voice tells a story of the narrator's immersion in a domestic routine. It's a fussy voice that talks about reading and the importance of cooking, house cleaning, daily rituals. I had my students write responses to the text that they brought to the class. And they all wrote about how it was a shock to them to find out that this narrator turned out to be male. They had all assumed that an interest in domestic routine would be the voice of a female. And it dislocated their assumptions about gender values in the society to realize this was a male. They read on for another few pages, and they discovered that this narrator was half black. They had all assumed, even the non-white students in the classroom, they had all assumed that this was a white narrator. And this led them quite spontaneously, without any input from me, to start asking questions about what it said about them as a reader, what it said about their society, that they had made these assumptions that turned out to be false. They had assumed woman equals house, and that someone who spent most of his time in the house would be female rather than male. And they had assumed a normative whiteness that the default voice was always white unless it was specifically named as other, as black or as queer. So this was a wonderful moment in the class, and it was a moment that happened in a non-threatening way. Nobody felt they were bad readers. They just felt that they were readers who were learning through their reading as they read. And this is another one of the things that literature in the classroom can do to encourage critical consciousness. So what I want to say now is a list of about nine points that I got out of hearing the two previous papers that I hope will give you a sense of summation and guide perhaps some of your questions. Um, I focused already on this session coming out of teaching. It comes out of teaching in a particular space that Brian named as a contact zone. It's interesting, I think, that Alberto named this same zone as that of an interpretive community. 
So it's interesting to think about how these two names of the same space provide us with different framings of that space and different ways into thinking about that space. And I would invite you to think about those, those two namings and how they connect to your own experience of classroom space. Um, the next point is that I think both of them stress the fact that reading and talking about reading is person formative. And I was struck by the fact that that is, I think, the best way of translating Bildung, uh, the term that I introduced the other day. Um, the next point is, is something raised by Brian that I don't want us to lose sight of, which is the gap sometimes between official policy and actual practice in setting curriculum, in setting pedagogical goals, in setting um, the right to participate in democratic society or even in classroom discussion. Um, a point that both of them stressed is the fact that students are creators. Students are not just readers and interpreters, but they're also writers or video makers. They are creators. And that reception and creation go together. They co-create each other. Uh, six, the next point is that the curricular decisions we make do influence what happens in our classroom and that there is huge potential in choosing literary texts because most literary texts, I think all literary texts, can operate to dislocate normative assumptions. Um, another issue I noticed in the two papers was the way in which each paper took a word that was normally used in a negative way and turned it into a positive. Brian took the word queer and in the middle of his paper, you may have missed it, but Roberto used the word contaminate. Both of these words are often used in negative ways. Each of these authors dislocated that normative use of these words to show the positive potential for imagining new ways of living together by reclaiming these words for a different vision of identity and of community. I want to return to Brian's emphasis on rights and needs. As he pointed out, we tend to focus often on our students' needs and to see them as needy. The focus on seeing them as co-creators of meaning encourages us to think about their rights. And as Brian spoke, I, I was reminded of two famous quotations from post-colonial theorists. The first is by Edward Said. He speaks about the right to narrate, the right to tell a story, the right to tell your own story. Secondly, more recently, Arjun Apadurai has written an essay about the right to research. That right to research can be interpreted as the right to create knowledge. And uh, both Brian and uh, Roberto talked about the many different genres in which their students uh, created knowledge, expanding our understanding of the way in which knowledge can be written as well as the way in which it can be read. Um, and finally, uh, I think Roberto's more theoretical discussion of gaps between um, virtual being linked to the impossible that imagination makes possible versus an actual world in which we have a sense of being limited by what is imaginable, um, creates a different way of thinking about the relation between the virtual and the actual. The virtual enables acts of imagination 
which in turn feed back into the actual world, enabling us to imagine better ways, different ways of thinking about the work that we do and the, what, what work that work can do in our societies at large. So this is some of what I've got uh, out of hearing this, this wonderful conversation uh, between the three of us so far. And I would now invite you um, to ask any questions you have or comments you might like to make uh, about our classrooms or your classrooms, our theory, your theory. So questions or comments, please. <laughs>